my colleague. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, good evening, uh, my colleague. Today, uh, I'm honored to be uh, introducing my uh, professor, uh, Professor Dr. Ayman Abul Magd, and I will join my deep friend, uh, Dr. Mustafa Al Muqarrab, uh, for uh, uh, moderating this session. Uh, actually, Dr. Ayman, as usual, he will give us uh, an highly scientific uh, uh, data analysis for left main uh, intervention, including the recently published data about uh, the left main. And uh, I hope uh, Dr. Islam and Dr. Mansour, uh, Dr. Islam Shauk and Dr. Mansour Mustafa to join us once uh, available uh, because we need uh, their opinion, mainly Dr. Islam, because mm -hmm. we want to know uh, the uh, ischemic risk uh, from the territories of the uh, side branch. So uh, please, Dr. Ayman, uh, you can start your uh, talk. Thank you very much. I think I will start sharing my screen. I am disabled. Can the host allow me to share my screen? Can the host allow me to share my screen? And I'm sure if, uh, uh, to share my screen. Dr. Mustafa. Fadala, Dr. Ayman. Okay. You can now. Okay. So, so it's called, uh, the title of my presentation is Left Main PCI After Euro PCR, A New Perspective. Really giving a new title, it is The Search for Truth. Um, that the life cycle of an intervention goes through different phases. Actually, three phases. One is the beginner, who basically is the youngest. He sees the older um, attend, um, attendings and professors doing things. So automatically he says, if they're doing it, that must be right. And the, the main concern is how. When you're young, you want to know how to do it. So they concentrate on learning the technique. Obviously, this is very, very important. Concentrating on learning the technique, studying how others do the technique, and then practices the technique. Who wants to do it for all cases. As they get older and more experienced, they become an intermediate interventions. And then they're comfortable. They feel that they are capable of doing the techniques. And then they start reading and analyzing the some of the data about the technique, which is what, what is he doing, he or she. And then they get older and more mature. And this is the stage where they combine the technical skills required for the technique with the scientific data to decide when to do the technique and when not to do it. We can summarize that one and two is basically for me. Three is for the patient. We'll start with the cases, but before I do, please, I want everybody, everybody watch, to concentrate in every single case I'm going to show, and there are quite a few. I want you to look at the lesion in the circumflex. These are left main cases. I want you to look at the lesion in the circumflex. Look at the length, the length of the lesion in the circumflex in all the cases, because this is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And I will get back to it later. And I will also ask a question regarding the lesion length. So please concentrate on this. Um, obviously we start with the osteo left main and um, these are easy to be missed, and that's why the best view is the LAO 20 and cranial 40. This is the view that shows you the osteo-left main lesions the best. These are um, 
usually calcified and you must predilate and best to be done in the LAO cranium because this is where the view that allows you to have optimal positioning of the stem. And this is where most of the work is done, making sure you're, you don't, you're not too much into the aorta. And at the same time, you don't want to miss those short osteal left main lesions. This is the result after it's done. Mid shaft are very rare. We would love to see them. They're not osteal, they're not bifurcation, and they are the simplest of all types of left main lesions. This is an osteo, uh, this, now, now we get to the complex lesions, the bifurcation lesions. This is a complex bifurcation lesion, the distal left main encroaching on the LED and the circumflex. This case was done with a T stenting and finished two stents in final kiss. And as you can see at the bottom is the final result. This case again, distal left main encroaching on the LED and circumflex this case was done with the tap technique, and this is the final result. This is a case we had um, with an infralateral ST elevation MI. And as you can see, it's a subtotal osteocircumflex. Uh, and we did with a two stent technique, a lot. And this is the final result after final kiss. Beautiful final result. This is a crush technique, an example. Again, distal left main encroaching on the circumflex. Look at the, the length of the circumflex lesion. This is a case that was done with the um, steps of the crush technique. And this is the final result. Now, kissing stem technique is a, really, we don't use it anymore. It gives you a long carina and this leads to higher restenosis rate. But in some few cases where you have a short, short left main and an unstable patient, you can do it. It's a life-saving procedure. It's a quick procedure. You have access to both LED and circumflex all the time. And the, the, the limitation of having of, of the standard SKS, which is a long carina, is not present here. So you carefully position the two stands and you can have a short carina and you can have an, a perfect result in a very quick fashion, easily saving some people's, some patients' lives. This is the final result after the SKS. And this is another patient who came with acute pulmonary edema. Um, he has an old CTO of the circumflex. And as you can see, the distal uh, left main is tight and hazy. Again, LAO cranial shows it and predilated. And then this is the RCA, which is diffusely diseased proximally, predilated, then stented. Um, sorry. And this is the final result. Beautiful final result. Then we went to the RCA, dilated, then stented. And this is the final result. You can see the Timmy myocardial blush grade three, excellent result. This patient did very well. Now, these are some of the, some cases you will see some more. I would like to take your opinion. What is the lesion length of the circumflex in all the cases? Was the length five to 10 millimeters? Was it 10 to 15? Or was it more than 15? I, I don't want to bias anybody. Dr. Masood, can you tell us, in your opinion, what was the lesion length of the circumflex lesion? And I believe these are representative cases of distal bifurcation left means. I, I can't hear you. You are muted. So uh, your question, Dr. Ayman, about the cases you did now? The length of the circumflex lesion in those cases. And they were all complex, as you can see. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a, it's a variable lenses. It's a, I, I'm sure it's a, including uh, five- Is it to, five uh, to 10? 
10 to 15 or more than 15? Yeah, actually for all the lesions, it's around 10 to 15. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mustafa, what do you think? Yes, the same, Dr. Ayman. It's okay. about 10 to 15. But not more. Not more. Thank you. This is very important. We will get back to it. The trials, what have we really learned and why? Well, we know the guidelines state that for all types of left main lesions, surgery has a class 1A. PCI, class 2A level of evidence B. It's all class 2A or class 2B. So the trials were done hoping to prove that PCI is equal to stenting, to uh, cabbage, and perhaps elevate the recommendation for PCI into class 1A, like search. Now, the Noble trial, PCI versus cabbage in patients with left main, and they found that the all-cause mortality was the same. But total repeat revascularization, as we would expect, was much higher in PCI compared to surgery. And the p-value was significant. Not only that, but surprisingly, when they graded the lesions according to the syntax score, less than 22, 22, 23, 32, or more than 33, for all the groups, surgery was better. The conclusion from Noble was that it was a non-inferiority trial. PCI did not meet non-inferiority for the primary endpoint of five-year maize compared to cabbage. Cabbage was superior to PCI. And repeat revascularization was higher after PCI. Then we have Excel. We know Excel was designed for five years. They gave the results at three years. And at three years, there was no difference between PCI and cabbage. But then, when they looked at five-year follow-up, they found interesting results. All cause death was much higher in PCI than cabbage. 13% versus 9.9. .9. This is 38% increase in all-cause mortality with PCI. Now, cardiovascular death definite was five PCI versus 4.5 for cabbage. This was not significant. Now, we are used to say, to think in terms of, we only care about cardiovascular mortality because this is a stent. But for the patients, it's all the same. It's all death. This is what matters. Now, this was not seen often in other trials. Is this just um, a fluke, something out of nowhere? Or is a mechanism that would explain it? This is the key question. Now, in the Excel, they used IVIS in about 70% of their cases, and it changed the, the, the decision. Uh, sometimes leading to using larger balloon or post dilatation or higher pressure or changing the plan from one stand to two stands. This is the uh, slide that we all have seen before. We all know it. And I'm showing it because I want to tell you it is wrong. We all know that we should aim by IVIS for the LED minimal stent area, six. The circumflex should be more than five, LED six, um, POC point of confluence, so seven, and the left main should be eight. However, this was done in Korean patients who have who are smaller and they have smaller BMI and um, they do not represent people outside of Southeast Asia. So 
let's go back. This is data. This is very important data from um, Professor Akiko Mahara, who is one of the top people using IVIS in the world. Akiko did IVIS for all these patients and she divided the results into three groups. Those who had a final IVIS MSA, what she called low, which was from 4.4 to 8.7, high was 11 to 17.8, and intermediate, which is in between. And what did she find? She found that cardiac death, MI, stent thrombosis, and ischemia vascularization was much higher in those who had a low stent area compared to those who had a high stent area. P-value 0.05, cardiac death was 6.8 if you had a low minimal stent area, 3% intermediate stent area, and only 1.9 if you had a bigger stent area, significant P-value. Infarction related to the left main, again, was 9.4 you had a low stent area, 3.1 if you had a high stent area, again, significant p-value. Stent thrombosis, 3.1 if you had a low minimal stent area, and zero if you had a high stent area. So this obviously explains much of what we found in, in the Excel trial, because, so it's not just all deaths, that's an, a coincidence, but there is a mechanism for it. So she decided that the cutoff for the left main minimal stent area should be 9.8 and not eight, as we saw in the previous slide, you, you remember. I cannot move, I don't know what happened. I can't move my slides. You can reshare again, Dr. Ayman. I am frozen. It's your computer problem, Dr. Ayman. You can uh, restart slide again. Nothing is happening. Yes. OK. Okay, so, um, so this slide where the left main should be eight millimeter applies only to Southeast Asians, people in Korea, but for others, it should be 9.8. This is a very, very important lesson that we must remember. So we can say that cabbage is better, remains better, but PCI is improving and getting close. In left main PCI, bigger is better. But we also have to remember that despite IVIS in the Excel, one third of cases still have a suboptimal minimal stent area. Again, if you look at these three groups, the low, the intermediate, and the high stent area, equal number. So it's one third of the patients. One third, despite the operator, doing their best, using IVIS, using bigger balloons, still they could not achieve an optimal stent area. And this is important because stents alter the flow dynamics and flow dynamics matter. That is why optimization is critical. This is a classification. I want to show this slide just to show you that we have so many different techniques for bifurcation stenting, whether SKS, pot, T, crush, um, mini crush, culotte, all these, we do the techniques of crossing and ballooning and kissing balloon and pot, aiming to maintain the circularity and the proper flow dynamics in the stand, aiming to be as normal as possible. We have to remember that God made the arteries circular. and changing the circularity disturbs the flow dynamics 
leads to disturbed shear. This is normal flow, laminar flow. This is disturbed flow, disturbed shear, leading to inflammatory genes, high endothelial cell turnover, oxidative stress, and the environment that leads to um, uh, atherosclerosis and problems in the stent and in the arterial wall. This is the normal laminar flow, and this is what happens when you have elliptical flow. You get the reversal of flow, laminar flow, disturbed flow, and stimulation of a bad events in the endothelium of the artery. And that is, as I mentioned, this is why we do kissing balloon pottery pot, aiming to optimize the natural circular shape. But how effective are they? Everybody does final kissing balloon inflation, but we've never really had data to show does it really work? Is it how important is it? This from Excel, TCT 2019. I was moderating this session at TCT 19. So I took it off the presentation. This is the influence of the final kissing balloon inflation on long-term outcomes after PCI of distal left main bifurcation, an analysis from the Excel trial. Greg Stone, George Dangas, David Kanzari, and Roxana Mahram. Their conclusion at four years, the rate of death, MI, or stroke, or ischemia-driven revascularization was similar with or without final kissing balloon inflation. No significant difference were noted with final kissing balloon inflation for primary or secondary endpoints at 30 days or up to four years. A routine strategy, final kissing balloon inflation at this the left main bifurcation may not be necessary, regardless of whether one or more stents are required for treatment. This is just a summary that I wrote. This is on 948 patients from the Excel trial. At four years, the rate of death, MI, TLR was similar with or without final kissing balloon inflation, regardless of using one or two steps. Surprising, but this is what happens when you put techniques to the test. Remember, the, long, the best long-term outcome is when the stent is fully deployed and completely circular. This can be achieved more easily in provisional stenting. In two stent techniques with kissing balloon inflation, you get an elliptical rather than circular shape. Then you try to repot, trying to make it circular again. Repot does not always succeed in correcting the elliptical shape because stent metal has memory. It is not putty that you can take no essence off. It retains, it has memory, it retains the shape. So when you pop, still there are some points we have to remember. I will get back to this later. The balloon must be short and should not encroach on the carina or you will get stenosis of the LCX ostium. You should pot using a semi-compliant balloon because this, it will get back bigger than a non-compliant. Why? In the left main, remember, the left main is bigger than we think. You want the balloon to get bigger. So long as, of course, the balloon is inside the stand. Be sure that the marker doesn't fool you and that the whole of the balloon is always inside the stand. In the DK crush, remember, when you do the final kiss, deflate the main balloon first and then the side branch balloon or otherwise the main balloon will recrush the side branch osteum and it will you will run into trouble and get instant stenosis now this is a slide that shows why you have to do pot when you do stent from the left main to the led you size according to the led because you don't want to oversize so obviously the stent here will be undersized. So you need to put a balloon here, make it bigger to optimize. And to do this, we have to do distal side branch, distal strut crossing into the side branch. 
when you cross into the distal strut, then you have optimization of the stent into the ostium of the circumflex. This does not happen with if you proxim if you cross in a proximal strut. Does this matter? Is it really important? Well, we will see. But before that, I just want to give you a small pointer. When you wire, you should always wire the most angulated vessel first. You should then you wire the more straightforward vessel going straight forward with the wire with minimal rotation. Avoid excessive rotation of the second wire. And always on the table, keep the wires separate during the PCI. This slide is very important because we get into the side branch. We put curves. Now I've noticed most people just put a curve according to the angle, but actually we have to remember, you can have say a 45 degree angle, it could be short, or you could have the same angle, but long. Does it matter? And based on what do we do this? Obviously you angle, you, the angle you put will be related to the angle of the branch you want to get into, the, the branch, which is the circumflex. Now the length, this length, you make it according to the diameter of the left main, of the main vessel. Here it would be the left main. If you're from the LED going into a diagonal, then this length, you make this according to the, to the diameter of the LED. And if you're in the left main, then this length will be according to the diameter of the circumflex. This is a very important pointer because I've noticed um, most, most people, there's no real study or place to read about wires, but this was actually published in 1988. Excellent review article in the journal Catheter Cardiovascular Diagnosis on wires and wire shaping. Now we'll go back to the pot. This is the, the left main and the two branches. This is when you've put the stent across. This is the orifice of the circumflex, okay? If the balloon you're using to pot crosses the carina, it encroaches on the circumflex and you see the lumen of the, the ostium circumflex is the yellow, it was big. Notice how it became very small. When the balloon here, when the balloon does not encroach on the carina, you maintain, you open up the stent struts to oppose the left main lumen um, wall while keeping the circumflex open. So it's critical to pot, but it is also critical to pot correctly in the proper position. Again, this is analysis of the two issues, which is proximal, when you cross with the wire into the circumflex, proximal wiring or distal wiring, it was found that even if you have proximal wiring, which is you shouldn't, still proper pot can correct it to a certain extent. So pot is really the most critical stage of the procedure. After it comes the wiring from the left main into the circumflex into through the disc. Now, <clears throat> what about when we do this, the procedure? In those patients who had target lesion, failure, stent thrombosis, instant stenosis, where does it happen? Does it happen in the left main, in the circumflex, or in the LED? Okay, this is a very important slide. We'll see that this is from 403 patients with distal left main PCI. We have non only 4%. If you have bifurcation, 
with a single stand crossover, it was a very low incidence of 6.3. But if you have two stand technique, the restenose was 25.4, very high. If you have bifurcation with a single stand, the highest area of restenosis was the non stented circumflex, which was 4.1. In the LED, it was 1.1.1%, but in the circumflex with no stent, it was 4.1. But if you have distal bifurcation, two stents, the restenosis was 25.4%. 23% in the LCX osteum, 7% in the LED, and 4.4 in the left main. So to summarize, one stand technique. Dr. Ayman, we, we lost you. 4.5. Excuse me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. That's clear. To summarize? Yes. To summarize, one stand technique, wrist nose was 4.5, single stand crossover from the left main to the LED, 6.3. The wrist nose was 1% in the left main and, and LED and 4.4 in the non-stented circumflex. If you put two stands, it was 25% wrist stenosis, 23.7 at the circumflex. So what we summarize is the single area responsible for the highest percentage of the circumflex. Okay, what about pathology? Renuver Mani is the number one pathologist in the world. She published this in the year 2020 on 46 cases with left main stents and the causes of stent failure, malapposition in 20%. Number two, struts crossing the side branch, the circumflex, in more than third, encroaching on third, more than 30%. This highlights the importance of distal wire crossing and proper pot. Very important slide. Many times we don't listen to the pathologist. We don't even attend their presentation, but we really can learn so much. And her data really confirms what we just saw here regarding where the problems are. Dr. Ayman, if, now, you, allow, if you allow me to, yes? to, explain, to explain back to the uh, last slide, please. This, this one? Yeah, the number two, stent crossing of the side branch uh, responsible for more than 30% restenosis. Did you mean this is uh, new carina or uh, new metallic carina? I, I think what she meant here is when you have the struts into the circumflex not open, not open properly. Okay. So they encroach on more than 30% of the circumference. That's why it's important to open the struts into the circumflex. And the pot, as we showed, opens the struts into the, maintains, maintains the flow into the osteal to the slide here. Yeah. If you, when you do the pot and it's not proper, crosses into, into the circumflex, into the, across the carina. This is the lumen of the osteocircumflex, the yellow. You see how it became small? But yes, if you I, do I, proper I, pot, yeah. you maintain the flow into the osteocircumflex. Yeah, this is what I mean, Dr. Ayman, because in the second row in this picture, uh, the bot was done while the proximal dot of the balloon crossing the side. Yes, and exactly. Not recommended. So we exactly. need the distal bot to be far away from this point. Exactly. Like the last one. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. You are absolutely correct. Thank you so much. 
and I, that's why I was so keen to put this slide because it illustrates beautifully this issue, which has been confirmed in the, in, at the instance of restenosis, and it's confirmed in the data from Renover Money. So prove the same very important point. Now, sometimes when you, this is the case that was done with a single stand, cross over into the LED, and then you often see this, and you wonder, do I now convert into two stands, or is this not important? This, this is where FFR and IFR are very helpful, and although this looks like a bad lesion, this is primarily carina shift. Yes, Dr. Ayman, I know, I know you are highly uh, uh, interested in this uh, lesion, of despite the FFR here, it's an insignificant 0.95, but really the anatomy, it's an ugly anatomy. It's subtotal occlusion. Correct. And That's why it's very important to use imaging. Yeah. This is follow up here at eight months, no change, and the FFR is the same. By Ivis Kang, who does the Ivis cases for SJ Park in Korea, and he's done more left main than anybody in the world, she found that the overwhelming majority of these lesions are due to carina shift, not due. Is this confirmed by FFR studies? We will see now. So this is using FFR in left main. You should first measure FFR in the least diseased vessel, preferably the LED with pullback. And as we know, FFR less than 80, revascularize, more than FFR, more than 85, treat medically. If it is in between, then you can do IVIST and combine the data. We will see, this is FFR of the jailed circumflex, like this, the, the, the, the um, angio we just showed with the tight circumflex. They looked at those 43 patients who had crossover stent from the left main to the LED, and then had post-PCI FFR of the circumflex. Of the 43, all of them had post-stenting FFR indicating no ischemia. Only three were actually ischemic. And this confirms the IVIS data from Kang that I just mentioned. Again, another study, 29 patients with left main to LED crossover stenting with FFR. Again, the FFR in the majority was above 0.8. And uh, there is some noise in the background, please. And when you follow, when they followed those patients with the who had jailed circumflex, where the osteocircumflex circumflex looked bad. They followed them up. And in those in whom they did nothing, they left them. There was no death. The only death was actually in the patient where they decided to do two, to convert from one stent to two stent technique. So what we can say is in the majority of of those stand from the left main to the LED, and you do proper pot, if you have pinching of the osteocircumflex, you can leave them alone. But we want to know when should we not leave them alone? What I do is as long as the patient has no pain on the table, no ECG changes, TIMI3 flow, leave them alone. Now, we all, regarding the techniques of distal bifurcation left main stenting, as we know, lately the fashion has been the DK crush. Every single uh, interventionist now, especially the younger ones, they want to do all cases using the DK crush. It's because of this slide by Chen published in Jack 2017. 
They took 482, this is very important, please concentrate with me here. 482 patients with distal left main bifurcations, half of DK crush, the other half provisional stent, one stent technique. And then they looked at the results. 450 patients, IVUS in 40%. And they found that 48% in the group, 47% in the group who had one stent were converted, which is very high. What was the results? Mortality, there was no difference between the DK crush and the provisional stenting technique. Target lesion failure was higher in provisional, 16.8 versus 8.9 in the DK crush, and this was statistically significant. This, target, this was due to target vessel infarction. When they converted, in the 47% crossover from single stent to two stent, they had a higher incidence of procedural infarction. And this was the main reason for the difference favoring DK crush. So this was a very unique finding, 48%, which is very high. We never see conversion from single stent to two stents. I see it in about five to 10%. Some reports have gone up to 20, 22%. They had 48. The other finding that was very unusual, extremely unusual, stent thrombosis. In the DK crush, it was 0.4%, extremely low. In the provisional stent, single stent, it was 4.1% extremely unusually high and not really representative of practice that we all see. Now, they explained this. They said, well, the reason was because the lesion length was 16 points. The average lesion length in the 482 patients was 16.6%, 16.6 millimeters in the osteocircumflex, which again is very unusual. The case, all the cases I showed you, and I asked you at the end, what is the lesion length in your opinion? Everybody said below 15 in all of them. Here, they had an unusual, they say it was 16.6 average lesion length, and that's why they had to convert. We've never seen this length in the osteocircumflex. Please, in your minds, go back to all the cases you've done. Look at the percentage. Look at the lesion in the circumflex in the cases you've done, and look at them, how many were actually long lesions at the osteocircumflex. Uniquely, and in the overwhelming majority, there are five to 15 max. So, they were, they decided to do a similar study. They called the, the European Bifurcation Club main, comparing single stand, provisional for distal left main versus two stand strategy. Again, they had 450 patients. 450 patients, two stent versus one stent strategy. It was done in 31 centers, 11 countries, 467 patients, all of them using the newest stent, which, is, which allows um, growth of the stent, which is the onyx. And what did they find? The systemic two stent techniques, 
versus the single stent, they found only 22% of the provisional needed to cross over and needed another stent. So the number we saw in the DK crush, which was 47%, it's only 22% here. And this is the antidote of all previous trials and my personal experience. And I would love to hear your, everybody's opinion on this. Dr. Ayman, uh, can I get back to this slide because I want to clarify with you one very important point here. Uh, in provisional stenting technique, it means provisional strategy. Yes, exactly. You can use, you can use one stent with, uh, uh, uh, without- Excellent with, point. Without, and you can use two stents. And in this, in this stepwise provisional uh, group, uh, they started by provisional, but ended by two stent technique like T and TAB or CLOT, but not shifted to the DK crash. So this is a point everybody should be remembered. And provisional, uh, uh, stepwise provisional technique, it's not one stent technique. You will start the provisional, then you will do another stent if you need after doing uh, uh, uh, implantation of the stent across the side branch. So the 222%, it's not crossover from provisional to the DK crash. It's a two stent according to the provisional philosophy or strategy. Correct. This is also what was done in the DK crash. Yes. You were allowed to cross over. And the point I forgot to mention, which is extremely important, extremely, I mentioned it's 47%. What were the criteria to convert from single stent to two stents? Nothing. Operator discretion. Not IVIS, not FFR, not symptoms, not EKG changes, not impaired flow in the circumflex. If the operator looked and said, oh, there is pinching of the, he would convert. And we already know that this is not correct because the overwhelming majority do not need another stand. We saw this in Kang, IVIS data, and we, I showed this in the FFR data. So this is very important. 47% in the DK crush converted to two stent technique, when, whereas on really no, no data. So to go to the European Bifurcation Club main trial, again, 22% needed to be converted to two stand technique. What did they find? They found no difference in everything, whether it's the primary endpoint in death, infarction, target lesion revascularization, and the stand thrombosis rate was 1.7 in the provisional, 1.3 in the two stand technique. Now, this is important because here it's 1.7. Remember, it was 4.1 in the single stand provisional in the DK crush, which is extremely unusual. I have never seen throughout my life, and I'm old, I have never seen a stand thrombosis rate of 4.1. With the bare metal stand, with the drug eluting stand, I have not stand thrombosis rate. That's why I didn't like this because we don't see this. It is not representative. Now, in conclusion, the, the European Bifurcation Club trial stated that stent treatment of true bifurcation left main disease has generally good outcomes, numerically fewer adverse events with the stepwise provisional approach, meaning that it was better but did not reach statistical significance.
certificates. Fifth, of patients in a provisional group required a second stent, it is not necessary to prejudge the issue and start with a non-provisional, meaning two stent approach. The, the stepwise provisional strategy should remain the approach of choice for the majority of left main bifurcation intervention. I just want to add something just interesting. If you, if anybody at CR and attended the session, this session, you will notice that Marie-Claude Maurice, I'm sure everybody knows her, one of the pioneers of PCI, of the main setting, said, I have never done a DK crush and I will not. The president of the European Bifurcation Club, Goran Stankovic, said, I don't like the DK crush. A good to Pichard enter, they were the people who did, who, who pioneered the TCT, said, I have never done a crush and I will never do a crush. And Antonio Colombo, Antonio Colombo, the father of the crush technique. And by the way, the first DK, the, the first um, crush was done at the, our hospital, our Hussein hospital. I assisted Antonio Colombo doing it uh, when he was at our hospital doing cases during the live course. Said, I don't like comparing the DK crush to another technique. I don't like studies that compare different two stent strategies because you cannot compare, quote unquote, Antonio Colombo. So in conclusion, we have much more to learn. We are closing the long-term gap with cabbage. Do not accept results of comparative effects of techniques without careful analysis of the data. And what have I learned? Just some pointers of what I learned after of left main PCI. The why, why am I doing it? It's just as important as the how, as the how. Is the patient best served by PCI? If you are doing it for you rather than the patient, then do not do, not do it. Optimize the environment for this risky procedure. Blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen, renal function. Study the angiogram very well. Make a plan and follow it. Anticipate problems before they happen. And have a plan for how to techniques and do them well. Remember that technique fashions change almost as frequently as clothes fashions do. Always predilate all left main lesions. Calcification is very common. It is critical to predilate to ensure optimal stent expansion. Inflate the balloon at high pressure, about 16 atmospheres for 10 to 20 seconds, depending on the arterial pressure. Deflate quickly. I use ultra diluted dye so that the balloon will deflate quickly. Once the blood pressure, remember, the stent, the, the left main, average left main is about 5.5 to 6. So this four millimeter balloon is not completely including the left main, which is much, much bigger. The blood pressure is your guide. IVS if available is very important and may actually improve long-term outcome, but is expensive, not always available everywhere. Still, to do a perfect procedure, then you need IVIS. But remember, in the cell trial, had IVIS. Remember to post dilate the left main with at least a 4.5 millimeter balloon at high pressure. Semi compliant. Why? Because the semi compliant balloon will get bigger. But make sure you're inside the stents. There are multiple techniques depending on the angulation and size of the LED and circumflex. Concentrate on two to three techniques, learn how to do them well and when you should do them and when you should not. Generally, you should be able to do most with a single stand technique, tap T and SKS in a very few selected cases. The crush, DK crush and clot are good, 
but the data keeps changing. And remember, lately it was the DK crush and now the nano technique, which we'll get back to this later is becoming more in fashion. Doing the technique proper is much more important than which one you choose. Again, this is number three. I'm, I'm talking about one, I convert from a single stent to two stents. If the patient, if I put the stent in the left main to the LED and the vein, or if there's ECG changes in less than TIMI3 flow in the circumflex, then you must convert into two stent technique. Easiest with a tap and a final kissing inflation. Now, the nano crush. How is it different? Well, it's, it's really quite the same with minor differences. As usual, two wires, um, you have a balloon in the uh, left main LED and then uh, the stent in the circumflex. And then you deflate and pull back the same balloon. And then you inflate the balloon in the left main LED into the circumflex. So you have a kissing balloon inflation here. Then you deflate, pull this balloon and wire, and you crush with a bigger balloon. This balloon is bigger than that balloon. That way you have optimal crush of the distal of the struts into the circumflex. Then you stand the main branch, rewire, pot and final kissing balloon inflation. This is a case that I love because I think what we really aim for is always the long-term follow-up. This was done in January, 2016. I will continue to give you the long-term follow-up. He's a 63 year old male smoker. Acute AVR was high, intractable angina, ejection fraction 14, Create 2.3. We sent him, this is what his cath looked like. Now we have to notice four things here. Number one, distal bifurcation left main. Number two, it's hazy, encroaching on the circumflex, which has a bad angle of takeoff. Look at this protrusion. Look at the lumen of the left main. Into to the area here. What is this? This is a ruptured plaque. So this is why it's an acute lesion with a ruptured plaque. And finally, look at the, the rest of the left main. It's, it's about the same size as the LED and in the areas here, it is less, indicating that the, all this area is diseased. We sent them, the patient was referred to surgery. The patient was so anxious, we had to put them to sleep. Top three to do the surgery, so we had to do him. We, um, I'm going to show, show you some of the steps. Predilated, we crossed into the circumflex first and then into the LED. Predilated, stented, and then we stented the LED, and everything was beautiful. He was doing wonderful. He had a distal lesion I didn't show in the LED. So after stenting the distal LED lesion, suddenly he started having severe chest pain, ST depression, blood pressure dropped from 110 to 85 immediately after POT. This is what haziness with the thrombus at the osteocircumflex. I was just about to go in with a balloon and then I, said, wait a minute, why? This is not stent thrombosis. This is a necrotic plaque in the left main. Remember I said it had an ulcerated plaque with haziness and high troponin. Um, so these are the lesions that are more likely to embolize. This is an embolus from the left. You don't need to, if you do more dilutation here, you could easily induce more thrombosis and emboli and make things much worse. 
So I decided to give a double bolus of Integral over 15 to 20 minutes while nervously sweating and looking and looking at the angio. Gradually, it improved dramatically. And then within 10 to 15 minutes, the patient was smiling, blood pressure was back up, ECG norm, flow was great in the circumflex. So I decided to leave it. Oh, sorry. And we have more than five year follow up. I still see him he's doing, he was discharged the next day. Two weeks later, the ejection fraction that was 14 became 48. He's fully functional, very active. My last contact with him was about a month ago. So you have to adjust, including the type of lesions. Just finally, I'm going to show you another case with distal, very tight subtotal, the left main, encroaching on both the LED and the circumflex. This is the spider view, and you can see how tight it is. You also have lesion in the LED. I didn't show you here because this is not really the point. Could easily do this. Many people would say DK crush. Probably many years ago, but here we just did one single stent. And this is the final result, very quick. And look at the circumflex. Beautiful. This was eight years ago. The patient still doing, doing well. I actually cast him two years ago and the, the left main was perfectly fine. He had a new right coronary artery lesion, which we stented. So I think it's always important to remember that we go through doing procedures and it's very important to combine the technical skills with the data, which will guide us to do making the best decisions for the patients. Thank you, and may you always be a wise interventionist. Uh, Dr. Fouad, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Th uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Mustafa. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayman, for... Uh, uh, very nice. Uh, if I may uh, make a Please. comment on, uh, on your talk and uh, presentation. From my uh, experience in the last uh, years doing uh, intervention, uh, obviously PCI to left main is not our bread and butter, as they say. It's not every day's work, and it differs from uh, one center to another, and it differs from one interventionist to another. <clears throat> uh, you talked about uh, the how uh, in Interventionists move beginners to intermediates to stages, and obviously this is something that you should not do uh, in the beginning. It done when you are more confident and more experienced, and uh, already done uh, several. That's number one. Number two, <clears throat> with technology and with time, things are not like in the past anymore. Angioplasty has completely changed uh, from the time in the, in the 90s uh, to now. And more junior doctors can be more skillful than uh, older generations. Uh, in what sense? Excuse me, you have something in front of the camera we can't see? Uh, maybe, uh. Maybe, it's, maybe it's my finger. I'm yes. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, yes. I'm just talking through my phone, yes. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, in the past, using imaging in these kinds of lesion was, and it is not available anywhere to be done. Nowadays, and I know there are underprivileged centers where imaging with OCT or IVUS is still a, a problem, but in well-developed centers, PCI to left main without imaging is almost a... Um, it's almost a crime unless it has to be done. 
unless there is no any other option. So in, in, in, in my view, uh, left main stenting has to be done with some sort of imaging, either OCT or IVIS. Okay, that, that's you, very... You let me just comment on this. This is a very important point. Obviously, imaging optimizes the procedure, but I have two issues here, two important issues. Number one, in the DK crush trial, which is what everybody wants to do, they want to do the answer to every single, with many people now, the answer to every single distal left main lesion, they say DK crush. And it's based on the DK crush five by Chan. In his study, only 40% use of IVIS. Only 40%. The second issue, and by the way, in the study I just showed, the European Bifurcation Club, four or five days ago, the European Bifurcation Club, in their 450 cases, all these were done by experts. The use of IVIS was 40%. This is not an opinion. I'm just giving you the facts. No, so, I understand. So the issue number one, I said I have two issues. Number one, 40% in Chen, DK Crush, used IVIS. In the European Bifurcation Club, 40% IVIS in the latest study. Now, my final and very important is this, the data I showed you from Excel by Akiko, who divided the final uh, results, the main minimal stent area, according to the IVIS. Despite 77% use of IVIS, and these were people, we have to remember now, these are not operators doing the case of left main. These are operators who were doing the trial called Excel. Why were they doing Excel? Because they wanted to do a study that was done perfectly, aiming to prove that PCI is equal to surgery, and therefore they can change the guidelines for PCI from class two into class one, like surgery. So these were operators who are highly to do the best using whatever is needed, including IVIS. And despite all of that, one third of the case in the Excel study, one third had a small minimal, final minimal stent area. So this means that even when you do everything at hand with the IVIS, with the balloons we have, with everything, in cases, we are simply not able to reach the perfect minimal stent area in the left main that we aim for. These operators were aiming for the best. Not only that, these are operators who knew that when they finish the procedure, the films will go to a core lab that will analyze it. So they know somebody is looking over their shoulder to see if they did a good of a job they done. They did their best. So there are limitations and not all the limitations can be corrected by IBIS. Obvious and definitive. As I showed in one of the studies in the Excel, IVIS will change your decisions from maybe giving, putting a bigger balloon or going with higher pressure, or maybe changing from one stent to two stent. But despite all that, one third, exactly one third of the cases where with the current tools, we still were not able to reach the best minimal stent area 
And this was reflected in a higher incidence of stent thrombosis, higher incidence of target lesion revascularization, and a higher death rate. So we are getting better, but we still have limitations. Personally, I think maybe we need bigger stents and bigger balloons for the left main. Maybe this will help us to improve the one third who had less than who had the lowest stent area. Uh, yani in conclusion, PCI to the left main is very, very uh, critical. Absolutely. Complication rates are high. And uh, that's why you need to optimize uh, <coughs> uh, your results and have the, a better result as possible. Um, if the imaging in the form of OCT or IBIS is present and you have a case of left main, definitely needs to be used. And if I may re recommend something, you should not approach left main unless you have to, without the use. All what you just said, just tell me, imagine all these uh, uh, uh, complications uh, that happened uh, with the use of IVIS, as you said, imagine of doing these procedures without. A case or two or 10 left mains is not uh, what you will usually find. Left main is not uh, something that you all operators are, can commonly do in everyday uh, lab work. As you said in your presentation, you have to think twice. You have to, you have to think why not surgery? And there are different reasons in, in different places and different uh, centers. But the, uh, the limitation of these studies, one of the limitation is not using IVIS because I'm 100% positive. Using IVIS in left main or OCT in all the cases will alter the results of the, of the studies. You cannot, because no way, even if you're so left mains, you cannot judge what's happening inside the left main and uh, uh, uh, the bifurc at the and the bifurcation site without looking inside your artery. Stent uh, uh, a position to the arterial wall is very very very important. Plug shifts, the angulation is very very important. Uh, tap technique, as long as it's very easy, but you have to be very careful careful with the angle to make sure that the, the ostium of the side branch will be completely uh, covered. So you have to make sure that you are at a 90 degree, not a different, different angle. So obviously it is uh, um, in some situations, you will have to do a, uh, a left main uh, stenting as you said before, the ostium and the mid shaft, which is rare, is yes, but that's much easier. Obviously, we're talking about distal left main. And I would have thought uh, the Abdul Masood said, with either one or two stenting with the stepwise is probably the best thing as the easiest thing and probably the best results without going into too many, uh, talking about too many technique, which one is better, the culotte or the crush or the mini or this or that. That's not very, very important. The most important is, is to cover the, the, the, the, the, the important parts. And the important parts here, of course, is the ostium of both branches. And if the stents are very well opposed, and the ostium is very, I totally agree. The, uh, the last thing I wanted to say, if you have pinching of the provision stenting, let's just say, for example, to the ostium of the circ, again, imaging here is very, very important. Rather than thinking 
So maybe you were clever enough to know that this was an embolus in your case, uh, which gone better with Integral. But you, you can, most operators cannot do that. They cannot depend on that. They don't have the same experience. They, they haven't done the numbers of the left main. So what can help them? Imaging. Imaging can help them. FFR in the CERC is bias. And that's it was, was showed that only three out of, uh, I can't remember the number, 20 something, were only showed positive. Uh, so pressure wire studies, depending on balanced ischemia and what's happening on the right coronary artery and whether there is collaterals from, from either system, the right to the left or left to the right. So, in, and in most cases, there are false positive and false negative result, especially in the, in the, in the left circumflex artery. So you definitely can depend on pressure wire study and tell you about- yeah, but let, let, let me just, let me just comment on this. Um, I showed, the clinical follow-up, and I stressed that there's, there was no penalty. There was no death. They followed them up, and there was no penalty, and there was no deaths in the group that had the deferred, where they left the osteocircumflex based on the FFR. So yes, there are limitations. However, the numbers of the patients proved by FFR, proved that it is safe to leave them. The data from IVAS that you stressed, and I'm very happy you stressed that it's very important, from SJ Park, who has done more left mains than anybody in the world. His Kang, who does IVAS for SJ Park, she's the one who showed that, yes, by IVAS, what we see pinching of the osteocircumflex in the majority, 78% under the crinus shift with no impairment of flow and no plaque shift, therefore does not need another, an extra stem. And I showed how the site of restenosis is predominant in the osteocircumflex. Therefore, no, ma no matter what you do, no matter what technique, I didn't show a slide. Antonio Colombo looked at all the various techniques <coughs> trying to decrease that high stenosis at the osteal circumflex. He tried all the different techniques, reverse crush, culotte, whatever. And he found that there was no matter what he did, it was always the osteal circumflex that had the subsequent restenosis. We have to realize there are limitations. It is, IVIS is a tool to help us using our weapons. Our weapons are simply not perfect for distal bifurcation putting metal in the both at this point in time. I, I, I totally agree, Dr. Ayman, and it's usually right. It's the ostium of the CERC. If you go to a provision stenting left main to the LED, that will cause the problem. And the problem here is not the ECG changes or chest pain on the table. The problem here, if this patient leave, come back, with even stable angina, and he starts to complain, you will have to bring him back and do something to the pinch, to the pinch circ. Uh, the ostium of the circ is but not- But I already showed that they didn't reason. come back. <laughs> no, no, no, I, I understand. I showed the case, clinical data. No, no, I, I understand. There is I'm no saying, penalty, there was no death. So it is safe. No, no, no, I, I, I, I, I know, I know. It is not a prognostic lesion. I, I understand, and that's why there was no death. But that's, it doesn't very mean important. angioplasty is mainly about symptomatic relief. It's not about prognosis. Only left main and osteal LED can show some prognosis. Any angioplasty that we do in any part of the coronary tree is about symptoms. It's exactly like nitrates. It does not prolong people's life. It does not prevent death. 
So that's why it did not show death. But it doesn't mean that the patient will not be symptomatic, even with stable angina. But our radio also showed that clinically they didn't come back hospitalization or death. We were just talking about that, so I mentioned that. We're, but the table showed all the clinical parameters. What I'm trying but to I say But I think is, uh, your points are well taken. Thank you. Okay, okay Dr. Fouad, uh, Dr. Ayman, very nice uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, actually, when you, with us, uh, the hero, Dr. Mansour Mustafa and uh, Dr. Mustafa Mukarrab, and do you want to give some comment about the two? How, actually, now, actually, Dr. Mansour. Firstly, welcome for uh, all my friends and our colleagues, and uh, also my professor, Dr. Ayman, uh, Professor Dr. Fouad, Professor Dr. Abdul Maksud, Professor Dr. Mustafa. For the nice day for listening intervention, as usual, with Dr. Uh, Ayman Abu Nag. I think, Dr. Ayman, uh, uh, simply as a conclusion, uh, listening this so I done by experienced uh, operator, and also must be done in the full equipped uh, catheter. <laughs> uh, uh, my question for Professor Ayman uh, is this scenario for elective DCI listening can be applied for let me name by profession in the acute setting. The first question. Second Sorry, can you say that? I didn't hear you. Please say it louder. Uh, first, first question this scenario, all the scenario. I can't hear. Uh, I'm muted. Let me name by profession legion, PCI. This scenario can apply for this uh, let me by profession in acute setting in acute coronary syndrome. The first question. Second question. If uh, we see as regard the geographical, uh, the circumflex artery is more than, than dominant, can apply on put in my mind the scenario for uh, shifted from one stent to uh, two stent as regard the prognosis of uh, circumflex. Is this in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the first question regarding, can we, uh, does this apply to um, acute coronary syndrome? Actually, the majority of the cases I showed were acute coronary syndrome, over acute coronary syndrome. And basically, frankly, most of them, you would like to send them to surgery, but surgeons don't like to take them in the acute coronary, in the acute phase. <laughs> Um, as I showed with the, obviously that 14% ejection fraction and others, but um, um, yeah. yes, yes, the, the, the majority were acute coronary syndrome, as you can see, acute pulmonary edema. I have another, some other cases that I, I forgot to bring the film oh, oh, with, with 65 that developed acute coronary syndrome and injection fraction dropped to 38. The patient was put on a ventilator at 4.30 in the morning, 9.30, we did the um, procedure on a heavily calcified with thrombus in the distal bifurcation left main on an elderly male, 86. And um, we did the procedure and um, immediately afterwards, the next day, the ejection fraction was back to normal. So most of these cases, you basically have, I was forced to do them. Um, very few really, what, what I would call elective. Um, so yes, absolutely. Now, um, I forgot the second question was regarding the diameter of the circumflex. Yes, about well, size. It's more, than, it's more than dominant circumflex. Uh, a large circumflex. Small, non-dominant, little. Small. Very good question. Very good question. When the circumflex is small, you're much more likely to do a single stent approach. Yeah. And basically, you just want to keep the osteocircumflex open. You'll always have two wires, and you go for the um, 
this is the left main left main to the LED. Now, uh, I forgot to mention something very important, which is technically extreme. As long as I don't take the proximal edge of the stand all the way to the osteal left main. If I can, I keep away from the osteal left main because that's because for reasons during the procedure and for reasons uh, long-term. Long-term, obviously, you want to um, be able to cannulate if you have to catheterize this patient in the future and you don't want to injure this stem. The second, a left main, your catheter is sitting there at the ostium of the left main. You're pushing wires, you're pushing balloons, then you're pulling balloons, and you're using big balloons because the left main is big, the LED is big, and the circumflex frequently is big. And when you're pulling the balloons back, it's very easy for the catheter to go in deeper and injure the stent. So you have, this is one of the very important points, which is avoiding LSD, longitudinal stent deformity from the balloon and from the guiding catheter. But direct answer to your question, most of them with a small circumflex will be done with single stent left main LED. Dr. Ayman, we we have from our uh, colleague, Dr. Abdul Aziz Abu Shahbadin. I will leave the floor for Dr. Mustafa Mukarrab and our yes, please. Uh, hero, Dr. Mansur Mustafa, to uh, conclude the day. Uh, so first, the question, Dr. Abdul Masood, first before uh, question, Dr. Abdul Aziz, uh, Dr. Ayman, uh, yes. thanks for this elegant presentation as usual. Uh, I noticed during, uh, uh, you showed us a multiple cases for bifurcation left main intervention. Uh, for third or fourth case, angle less than 70 and you did uh, tap technique. And for fifth case, angle less than 70 and you did uh, DK crush technique. Uh, do you have a strategy for choice in two stent technique? This is first uh, question. Second question, and many uh, DK crush technique, nano DK Let crush me answer technique. the first question. Okay, okay. Yes, many of those were done a long time ago. Yes. A long time ago. This is over a span of many years. So the strategy changed as more data and knowledge appeared. But generally, obviously, the data is clear. Okay. So, yes, I agree. Okay. Uh, for uh, nano DK crush technique, uh, you did by uh, uh, kissing after uh, uh, pot or pot kissing and then pot again? Kiss, pot, kiss. Kiss, pot, kiss. No final pot. Uh, I like to do a final pot. Yes. I like to finish. The last thing I do is always pot. Because we, we want to maintain a circular shape of uh, left mean. Yes. Although it, it, it doesn't always correct the elliptical shape, but I still, I like to know that I did my best. Okay. Thanks. That's why one of my issues, final kiss, as, I, as you, I mentioned before, based on the data I showed, I was in a long discussion with Dr. Goran Stankovic on Twitter a couple of months ago, based on the data from Excel and based on the issue of the final kiss leading to a more elliptical shape rather than a complete circle. So if it had, as we saw in the Excel trial, then perhaps we might stop this. We don't need to do it. And he referred me, Goran Stankovic, president of the European Bifurcation Club, he referred me to a recent editorial, his last editorial in European Heart Journal, 
on this issue. And I read it. And all he said at the end was, there was no penalty for the final kiss. Now, no penalty does benefit. <laughs> okay? It's just another way of saying there was really, we cannot prove there is a benefit. So to me, being worried about the elliptical shape, I might just forget the final kiss, or if I'm going to do it, what I do now is I basically do it with an undersized balloon in the side branch. That way, I minimize the effect of the side branch balloon on the main branch elliptical shape and then finish with a final pot. Perhaps this might be better. Okay, so uh, before the conclusion from Dr. Uh, Mansour Mustafa and Dr. Mustafa Muqarrab, there is very important question, one from Dr. Abu Shahba and one from Dr. Abdurrahman Mitwali. The first one from Dr. Abu Shahba, are multiple layers of crumble distinct at the side branch ostium substantially increase the rate of side branch osteal instantaneous stenosis with DK crush than provisional? Question. Um, hard to know. We know for sure, for a fact, that the osteal circumflex is the predominant and major site of instant restenosis. There are multiple reasons for that. One of them would be the layers of stent being crushed there. I personally think that we don't, we as cardiologists, we don't really understand the osteal circumflex very well. It arises at an, an angle and this angle is affected by the cardiac motion, rotation, the contractility, and multiple factors which affect the shear forces there. And I think that it's not always, what we see is not always what is happening inside. And our attempts to make it look better, not always, although it looks better, it doesn't really improve. Perhaps the rotation and the contractility at that ostium are more conducive to abnormal shear forces and more restenosis. There are multiple issues, multiple reasons that lead to a higher restenosis rate at the osteocircumflex. And one of them, as mentioned in the question, I believe is overlapping multiple struts. So second question uh, uh, from Dr. Abdurrahman Mitwali. And uh, uh, his question about, we are using a provisional stenting technique, stenting uh, distal main vessel, which is LED, then back to the left main. So his question about, what about the inverted provisional technique? Uh, it's a man, if you will do it, it's a mandatory to stent the LED or did it or prohibited to do it? Nothing is prohibited. There's no such thing. It's always about doing the right thing for the right situation. It is not about what I want to do. It is about the issue. Is about what is the proper thing to do for this special situation. I do believe that there are very unique, rare situations where you can probably, you put a stand from the left main only into the osteo, only into the circumflex. They're very rare. I have not had to do it, frankly, but I can imagine it could happen, and probably you can just put a stand 
just as the same way as we do from the left main into the LED. But, but if you do this, you probably will have to do, you probably have to open the struts into the LED, which would mean that you're going to injure the endothelium and perhaps atherosclerosis. So it's, it's, it's a difficult question, but I do believe it will be extremely rare. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ayman. Unless, so uh, unless we have new stents with much larger struts areas mm -hmm. that will, uh, would be like an osteal, normal osteal LED. So we will move now to Dr. Mansour Mustafa, Dr. Mustafa Mukarrab to give us the comment and the final conclusion for our uh, highly scientific day today. Dr. Mansour. Okay, okay. Thank you so much for uh, our professors and this, uh, our for this nice day. Uh, I think the lectinin, this distal lectinin bifurcation PCI, must be do uh, also with the well experienced operator. And, and, and I am one of the operator. I prefer uh, usually uh, one stent much better than two stents. And uh, the two stents who indicated only who shifted from uh, professional to two stents with any one of techniques uh, proper for uh, uh, this patient and they can differ from patient to patient according to angles and anatomy of the angle. And also, uh, the indication of uh, second step is very important, well known for the operator. And also, uh, it's very important uh, the operator must be expected the complication and how to deal with this complication and for it. And uh, uh, I mean, for this next section. Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Fouad Badin. Again, of course, thanks to Dr. Ayman for uh, this nice presentation. Uh, uh, I'll mention one comment or one uh, uh, quoted uh, uh, words from Dr. Ayman. It's not about the name of technique, it's about how to perform the technique in perfect or semi-perfect manner with respect to anatomy and angle. It's applied for all bifurcation intervention. Thanks again, Professor Ayman. Dr. Thank Fouad. you for attending. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Any more comments? Dr. Fouad, no, please. Just, just wanted to thank uh, uh, Dr. Aymar Um Very nice. Thank you uh, for your comments. For a presentation, and uh, hopefully uh, we do it more often. Inshallah. Okay, so Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Mansour, تفضل. يعني يعمل لنا بقى. Alhamdulillah, uh, this is really one of the most important topic and difficult topic in, in, in intervention in cardiology. Ayman, he gave us a very nice summary as usual uh, for the left main intervention. We enjoyed so much the presentation and the, the comment from Dr. Fuad, Dr. Mansour, Dr. Mustafa Muqarrab, and actually, Every day we are believing so much in the provisional aesthetic technique. And again, again, again, all of us, we know that the provisional, it's not a single aesthetic technique. It's a strategy to start with one stent, then you will complete either T-tab or cloth technique. Thank you so much for this very nice, highly educational day to uh, Mustafa Mukarra for your effort. Dr. Mansour Mustafa for this scientific day. And uh, uh, we want to continue every week a very highly scientific discussion in every topic in intervention cardiology and all cardiology. Thank Inshallah, you so much. Inshallah, Thank next week, Dr. Abdel Maqsoud, uh, we have a, a talk about hypertension uh, for our colleague, Bussi Gradit.
Okay, inşallah. İnşallah, inşallah. Okay. Selam aleyküm. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam. Selam.